great about that, other than trying to help people who are in the state of disease. Welcome back to the Immigration Answer Show. My name is Jim Hacking. Today is Monday, no, Tuesday, the 23rd of January, 2024. How's everybody doing? This is episode number 519, 519 of the Immigration Answer Show. We are trucking along. It's hard to believe that January is almost over, but here we are. Let us know in the comments where you're watching from. If you haven't been with us before, that's usually how it works. My friend Huli's on the boards. And she will let you know how to get into the waiting room if you want to ask me a question. We love to hear from where you guys are watching, where around the world we have our fans, our friends of the show. We love hearing from new friends and old friends. We try to keep it fun. We try to keep it kind. We try to keep it real. And we try to answer as many questions as we can in one hour. I will be here, like I said, for the next hour trying to answer all of your immigration law related questions. Um, let me go ahead and get started. Brian is in the waiting room, and I'll talk to Brian. Hi, Brian. Sorry about that. Hi, no Jim. Uh, doing good. Uh, so uh, thank you for putting on this show. I wanted to walk you through a little bit about my case and try to get an idea on uh, where I stand in terms of uh, authorized or unauthorized employment. Um, so I was brought in the U.S. as a child. And um, I, I guess after my F1 student visa, I was at risk of going out of status, uh, reaching out to my previous attorney. And based on the interpretation, we applied for DACA process. I was rejected and shortly because uh, I was never apparently out of status. Uh, so then I um, apparently once I got the letter, I uh, left and went back to my home country in Canada. Uh, fast forward six years later, uh, you know, I graduated up there and I got a job up there. I, in between that time, I was visiting one or two months at a time. I came back and traveled around uh, US and had been working remotely uh, for an employer out in Canada, uh, providing services to clients in Canada and getting paid in Canadian money as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Running it by my previous attorney, uh, after a short while, I filed for adjustment of status uh, as a son over 21 years old. And uh, it was about 120 days after my second entry or 185 total if we were to combine both of my entry points of that year. That being said, uh, again, filling that form out with the previous lawyer, uh, the application submitted had said present under the listed of the current employer in Canada and the date. Um, wait, 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 time out, time out, time out. How old were you then? Uh, when, when I entered, uh, when I filed for adjustment of status, I was, I'm older than 21. So, so, hold, okay. So let's be clear. So what's the receipt date on the I-130 on which you're filing for adjustment? Uh, that would be 2022. So what you're telling me is, is that a parent of yours, who's a U.S. citizen filed an I-130 for you. And at the same time you filed a 485. Yeah. So yeah. they, they filed the adjustment of status for me on that 485 they were they are uh they were on uh what's it called they were green card holders they're currently about to become citizens okay but and you did this all from inside the united states yes sir and you and you've been here ever since it was on file yes since my adjustment of status has been applied but you can't apply you can't apply for adjustment of status that 45 shouldn't have been receded um well, I guess, okay, so then maybe I'm using a lot wrong vocabulary here, but uh, we basically applied for an I-131 uh, employment uh, visa and the 485 uh, within the U.S. while I was Doesn't here. You, wait, hold, um, on, hold on. You just said 131 in employment. You're throwing things out there that aren't making sense to me. Okay. So who filed for you? Who's the petitioner, your mom or your dad? My dad. So your dad filed an I-130 petition for you. There's no reason to be nervous with me. I mean, it's all good. 
So your dad filed an I-130 for you and he said, I'm a green card holder and I want to sponsor my unmarried son for lawful permanent residence. Yes, sir. And along at the same time that the I-130 was filed, a 45 was filed. Yep. That was wrong. Who told you to do that? Uh, the attorney. Are you sure it's an attorney? Yeah. Okay. Does the attorney do things other than immigration? No. You can't file a 45 if you're over 21 inside the United States because there's there's no visas available for nine or 10 years. And you sure as hell can't stay in the United States while this is pending. Uh, I received my, uh, what's it called? Seven, my work, my EAD uh, in the meantime. So that's all wrong. That's all wrong. I, I, so you filed a, one, a 765 and a travel document and all that stuff. All together. Yep. All in October. So USCIS has made some mistakes. You guys made some mistakes. None of this should have happened. You can't you can't apply for adjustment of status concurrently with an I-130 if you're talking about the F2B category. The you're you're sure your parents didn't file an I-130 for you a long time ago? I guess not, because they wouldn't have been green card holders. No, yeah, they did they did file a long time ago. So I guess that's 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 like as, as I mentioned, I think that I think I might be confusing my vocabulary, but the I one thirty was filed a long while back in okay. like two thousand and sixteen. And yeah. Okay. So okay. So, so now what we're talking about, we're talking about mom or dad as green card holders filed an I-130 petition for their unmarried son years ago. Now it's become current. You entered on a visit visa and applied for adjustment based off that visit. Yeah. Yeah. Based off that based off that old I-130. Yeah. Okay. So that makes more sense. Okay. So what's the question? So the question is uh because of uh you know having in total, uh, as I was coming in the first visit and the second visit, I had 185 days total combined. And then they applied for the adjustment status within that time. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned that there was a present, I put down present in terms of my employer outside in Canada. Uh, I was not made aware of any risks with that. And I was employed um, shortly there on after and with uh, with the Canadian employer remotely, I want to know if any of those would be an issue. Uh, well, let's back up. When did you enter? Uh, October. Um, this was beginning of 2022. On a B1, B2? Yeah. Okay. And um, how long after arrival did you file your 45? Um. The well, the first time I arrived was uh, for uh, only a, what? What was it? Like twenty days? The trip. The trip on which you. The trip on which you filed. How many oh, days? I want to know how many days between when you entered okay. and when you filed. Uh, it was about a hundred and twenty-five days. Okay, so like, almost four months into your visit into America. Yeah, I was traveling around, so yeah. And when you filed your 45, you listed employment in Canada. Yes, I was I was remotely employed in Canada. And you're asking me, do I think it's going to be a problem that you've been here in the United States working for a Canadian company getting paid in Canada? Yeah. While before you got your EAD off the I-130. Yep. Uh, it could be. Probably not, but it could be. Okay. Uh what would you suggest would be the next steps? Because my I wasn't told of the risk of this. And then I just recently understood the risk of this. I'm no longer working there, but I just didn't know about that at all. Yeah. I mean, as I often say, the United States immigration regulations have not caught up to technology. So when these regulations were written, somebody really didn't have the power or the ability to work for a Canadian company inside the United States over the internet, right? So I would say, keep telling the truth about this, deal with it as it comes. Do I think it's gonna keep you from getting your green card? Probably not, probably not. But I think you're gonna to have to be ready to make the argument that this was not unauthorized work, that you, that you didn't violate any of the regulations because like you said, you were working for a Canadian company, getting paid in Canadian dollars for work done for Canadian companies. So I think that, you have the argument, but you probably need to go in there with like a brief and citation to the regulations and case law 
arguing that a it's not employment and the, you know it's not unauthorized employment and b um, I'm still entitled to a green card. Okay, all right. But most uh, most important is just keep telling the truth about it and be ready to argue. Okay, and do they do they ask for a proof of employment um, on that in terms of like the terms that I worked like going to the green card interview? Would they say bring in your proof of employment um, from that company in terms of how long you worked there? They might. Um, okay. Or they might ask for it at the interview. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Bye, Brian. Good luck, buddy. Hardik is here. Hello, Hardik. Hello, Jim. How are you doing? Great. How are you doing? Pretty good. Uh, my first time here. I just came across your uh, all your videos yesterday. Very helpful. Thanks so much for doing this. Sure. Uh, so my question uh, is, um, my wife has been a green card holder since July 2015. Um, she's had a few, she's had a couple of instances where she was out of the country for more than six months. So that broke her continuous residence. Those were back in 2016 and 2018. Uh, but since May of 2019, she has maintained continuous residence. Um, as of the five years would be coming up um, late, late this year. For her to qualify for uh, naturalization but i've heard of the rule for the four year one day uh yeah. if that is that's the case does does that apply since she's had these two breaks of more than six months but those are back in 16 and 18. so the question is what was the day what was the day that she came back from the last long trip uh may 2019 may of 2019 so she can apply now she can apply four years and one day after that trip Okay, uh, and, and where in the application would we need to make note of that or just based on the dates that we enter, it should be implied? Yeah, yeah. Now, the only other thing is we have to also look back the last five years and make sure that she stayed in the United States for at least half the time. Is she cool on that? On that? She did, she did. I mean, since May 2019, she's she's gone outside, but those have been less than six months and uh, it's been like 140 days, but that still counts within the four years, one day window. Right, yep. So she she should qualify, and, and there's no other. Um, it, it should, should be annotated in in certain way in the N four hundred no. form. It should be implied. No. no, the only thing the only thing I would ask is, and this probably doesn't matter, but so when did she originally get the green card in twenty fifteen? Fifteen, yeah. And how'd she get it through employment or what? Uh, family based. Okay, and once she got the green card, how long did she stay before she had that long trip in twenty sixteen? Like a year. A year, yeah. Yeah, I think you're fine. Yep, you're good to go. Uh, and, and, oh, just to make note, I mean, probably doesn't matter, but she did not have a re-entry permit. So she just came back from those two trips uh, and she was allowed to enter without any re-entry permit. How long were they? They were like 11 months-ish, so between 6 and 12 months, not yeah. over a year. You're okay. So we can just apply as is, should be fine? Yep. Wow, okay. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks a lot. Bye, Hardik. See you, buddy. Thank you. All right, all right. Go Lions is here. That's what I'm talking hey, about. Hey, Jim. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my friend just got his uh, his I-130 for both his parents approved, and it's now in the National Visa Center. So he sure. was just wondering, what's the procedure next? That's the question. And two, what was the other one? Um, uh, does he have to do a separate um, affidavit of support for both? Yes, he does. And so, you know, so when the case gets approved at USAS, it gets sent to the National Visa Center. They'll send him uh, documentation opening up the case. He'll have to pay those fees. He'll have to file affidavit of support for each of them and have to fill out a DS-260 for each of them. And then um, once, and then he'll have to submit a bunch of evidence called the checklist. And then once he does all that, then it's sort of like starting over with the State Department. You go from USCIS, which is one agency, to the State Department, which is another. So you go from paper to electronic, but you're sort of starting all over. So he's got to prove it all over again, and he's got to do the affidavit of support. And then once he's documentarily qualified, then he just has to wait for, they just have to wait for their interview at the embassy overseas. Oh, okay, no, no problem. I think that answers his question because he's right here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, all right. We're clearing people out of the waiting room, so hopefully those complaining in the comments will be able to get in. Timbers fan is here. What's up, Timbers? 
There we go. Hey, Jim. Um, thanks for taking my call. So I got a couple of questions um, that have to do with a with some denials. So a relative of mine, uh, she is a DACA recipient, and um, she filed a 485 about a year ago. Based so on? On marriage. To? Uh, her husband, U.S. citizen. Okay. Um, so, so it's coming up on a year, and so she was starting to get a little concerned um, because uh, she might be getting called for an interview. Um, so, so the reason is because her husband and her have been living apart this entire year. They're not really sure what to do with their relationship, um, but he is still um, willing to to help her out. Um, to do whatever it, it's necessary to help her get her uh, her residence. You know, wait, just real quick. You know, I hate that phrase, helping her out. That just sounds like bullshit. I'm just helping her out to get a green card. No, you're not. You're married and you're trying to keep your spouse so that you can keep together. Why do they live apart? I'm not really sure. Um, it's uh, they're just they're thinking about separating, but they they haven't quite decided. They have a uh, they have kids. And so um this all happened while the the case has been pending and so i think his attitude is you know he's still he's still willing to do whatever is necessary i'm not really sure that he knows exactly all the ins and outs of how this works but um but he's still willing to help her out anyway so so she's thinking well if we get called for an interview um she wasn't sure how this was going to work and so she was thinking, well, if uh, if it gets denied, um, she has done some research and mentioned that maybe there's some appeals, things that, that people can do. But she has also heard that a denial could also turn into uh, putting someone in deportation proceedings. And so that would be the, the worst case scenario for her. And so she was thinking, um, uh, you know, first of all, is that possible? Again, yes. she's a DACA recipient. Does she have DACA right now? She does. Did she enter with inspection or did she come across the border when she was little? Um, so without inspection as a child. Okay. But um, so she did the advanced parole through through DACA. Good. And, okay. and I do want to, I, I think she wanted to ask about that too, but um. But anyway, just to finish that first part of the question, so she wanted to know, is it possible to be put in removal yeah. proceedings if it gets denied? Okay. Not if you have DACA. If you have DACA, you won't, unless they think this marriage is fraud. And then if, if you get hit with a fraud finding, I think that would negate your DACA, I would think. So I think the chances of it are small. But why is she messing around with this marriage? How long has she actually been married to this person? Um, I So I believe this was in 2018. The marriage. And, but the case has only been on file for a year. Yeah. So before that, I know that they that they attempted to do the consular processing and then COVID happened and then that that went nowhere. Um so so okay, so we were sort of talking about it. If if they get called for an interview, you know, is that something that they should be concerned about? Or you know, if they get well, called for an interview, I mean, it, sound, it sounds like a very thin case. It sounds like a marriage of convenience. It sounds like he's trying to help her out. It's trying to get her a green card, but they, they don't live together. They haven't lived together for a year. And as of right now, you haven't told me. Um, you haven't told me why they um, haven't lived together. I think that's the most important thing. If they've never lived together. I mean, they have kids together, you said. So that's helpful, I guess. But this whole thing has been way too, they got married in 2018. They wait until 2022 to file the I-130. That's really stupid. These are these are not people that are taking her immigration status seriously. Yeah, and I know that uh, because of COVID, I think it got delayed years. Um, they were waiting for, for that waiver to, I think it's yeah. called a 601 something. Um, so that makes sense. Okay. All right. Yeah. Still, fundamentally, well, maybe the, the I-130 is probably already been approved then. The I-130 has already been approved. Yeah, I know the, that the, the first part of it was approved. 
mm -hmm. the, the, the 130. It was just the, the 85 that was still pending. Um, I would imagine, well, I would imagine that if, if her case rises to the top that they would call her in for an interview, because this is a confusing fact pattern, even for me. So I think they'd probably call her in and want to talk this all through. And then if they figure out that the marriage has fallen apart or whatever, then I think there's bigger problems. Okay. So then, um, what about the option to withdraw the case? Do you think that would be a smart thing to do before there's a determination? How does that work? So that would be that. I can't tell you that unless I yell at both of them and tell them how dumb they are and see how they do. Right. Like I, I based on what you're telling me, no, I'd want to know why they live apart before I tell you to just, I mean, dismissing it and dropping it is sort of a drastic measure. If, if I talked to both of them and I felt like there was something here that, maybe could be rekindled or could, um, or is dead, then that's going to impact my answer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the, so, so the last part was, uh, I know that the, the, uh, the 601, the, the waiver, because they quit pursuing that it, it eventually was denied. Uh -huh. And so she wanted to know what, so when something like that gets denied, is that where it ends, or is it possible that it could it could turn into something else later on? Could it affect they, her? They would have had to appeal that earlier, right? Um, if they didn't appeal that, then that's over. But if she, if the only reason she needed the waiver was for the unauthorized entry, then the fact that she went out and came back, she went out and came back on advanced parole, or she just got advanced parole and didn't use it. No, she she did leave. Yeah. Yeah. So she's got a valid entry for purposes of adjustment. So. So that waiver is sort of not important anymore. Okay, so she can forget about that one. I don't think there's anything to think about. If if she if she abandoned it by not appealing it, and if she already has the valid entry, then who cares? Okay, okay, okay. So so just to to recap, uh, Jim, so so I can communicate this clearly. Um, do you think there would be there would be any wisdom in withdrawing the case uh, at this point, since it's probably getting close to a determination, or just to proceed with the interview and 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 see what happens? If if they're living apart and the reason they're living apart is because the marriage isn't going well, then I think that there's real risk. I'm not going to answer the question. I just think there's real risks to proceeding, because what I'm mostly concerned about is a fraud finding more than anything. Okay. All right, Jim. Bye. See I appreciate ya. it. Thank you so you much. It. Yep. Have a good day. All right. All right. Noah's here. Hello, Noah. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Great. How are you doing? Good, good. So uh, I'm here to consult regarding my case. Uh, I, I entered the States in 2016 on an R1, R1 visa working for a religious uh, uh, organization mm -hmm. as an imam. And um, my visa was uh, expiring in 2019. Uh, and I renewed it through the lawyer, uh, through the attorney, and uh, it. Uh, so, after the renewal of my, uh, after we applied for the renewal and we got the renewal, we started working on applying for I for uh, I three sixty in order to get the green card. But uh, as soon as we applied for I three sixty, um, the dates uh, retrogressed. Sorry. The dates retrogressed. The delay. They became much more of a delay. Yeah, because of COVID. So I got my I three sixty approved in twenty twenty two, basically, uh -huh. and uh, my visa the second time re the the, the R one expired in twenty 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 one October twenty twenty one. So I wasn't informed by my lawyer that I had to leave the country. I was not supposed to say while my I three sixty was in process and my R one expires. I thought that as I I three sixty is processing, I'm still able to. I've seen I've seen this movie with imams. I've seen this movie with imams four times. Wow! So uh, because people think people think an R one is like uh, employment based H one B where you just keep renewing the H one B while the I one after the I one forty has been approved or filed for, but that's not the case. So where are you inside or outside the United States? I'm inside. I'm still working. The so the case is uh, the thing is that after I got my I three sixty the I three sixty approval. The lawyer did apply for I-485, and we got the uh, 
uh, me and my wife, we we got the uh, the working permit. We got the social. Uh, she got the social security on our R two. But the case is now that we just got an, uh, a notice from uh, the immigration USA. Yes, they're requesting for. Uh, for me, they're requesting two things: submit the evidence with esta- which establishes that you continuously maintain a lawful non-immigrant status from October 2021 right. till 2022. Uh, right. Right, and also submit evidence for your employment authorization from October one when my R one expired. Yeah. So now so is, that when you, is that when you found out there was a problem? Right. This is what okay. I thought. Lawyer knew about it, but he did not. He just woke up. I think after he he he, he did not did he did not have me in. in uh, uh, yeah. Is this an immigration lawyer or somebody who's just helping out at the mosque? No, it's an immigration lawyer. Okay, and what's his explanation as to how he messed this up? Uh, now, uh, of course, he's he's defending it by, by saying that uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID hit and and no, it, COVID COVID's got nothing to do with this. Right, he's saying I three sixty usually does not take does not take this long. Is it is abnormal? It's not normal. So we can file. We can. We can sue the immigration, or we can tell them that hey, it's you who messed up. You 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 delayed it. So that's why I'm here to ask you, what is the right thing to do now? Well, first of all, you should stop talking to that lawyer because you might have a claim against him. Number two, you should send me all your paperwork, and I'll look it over. We'll see if there's something we can do. I don't think that there is. I don't. There's no. What what was the lawsuit against USCIS? Be what was their mistake? They didn't make a mistake. Uh, of um, not basically a lawsuit. It's just uh, blaming them for delaying I three sixty. So there has been some clarification recently about delay that's no fault of yours, but I, I'm pretty sure that given the fact that I've seen this movie four times with R1s and Imams dropping the ball, I think that there's probably a good body of case law that says um, you have to anticipate that and that it's not immigration's fault, it's your fault or the lawyer's fault. Um, but I'm happy to look it all over if you want, as long as you promise to stop talking to that stupid attorney. For sure, uh, I've been trying to reach out to the. I went through the website to, for, but I'm I'm not sure how to do that. Can you please lead me how to contact your office? Yeah, see that see that um, email info at hackingimmigrationlaw.com. Just send it there, and we'll go from there. So you haven't filled out anything on the website yet. Uh, I did f- f- uh, I did fill, but my um, I, actually my friend he was he told me about this uh, show, so okay. I just for him. But I filled uh, the application on, web, uh, on the website, but I didn't get it. Right. Cool, you'll try to find you, and then we'll go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sheikh. All right. Assalamu alaikum. All right. All right. Yeah, we've seen that movie before. Unfortunately, everyone thinks R ones are like H one Bs, but they're not. Tom is here. Hello, Tom. Hey, Jim. How are you today? Good. What's up, buddy? Thanks for doing this. Hey, just maybe just just a quick one. Uh, I think um, in the event, uh, you know, in in a case where uh, a marriage case, a way case, and the uh, the the um, the spouse has uh, has children, that'll be under uh, you know each under a, a separate I one thirties. My question is, <clears throat> if the child is if one child is seventeen years old at the at the you know time of marriage. And apply for the I-130. Um, you know, by the time that processing happens, goes to the visa center, etc., the kid will be 18, and no longer a minor child. They're still a minor. That, for, for purpose of green cards, it's 21, not 18. Uh, gotcha. So that means, this, okay. I guess my question though is, uh, maybe you answered it already. Does it? Does that person? Does that child? Still need the the formal permission of uh, of the biological father. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. Probably, but I don't know. Okay. Okay. Probably depends on the law of the country and whatever the U.S. says. Yeah. Okay. Probably safer just to get it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That was it. Thank you. Bye, Tom. See you, bud. Thanks. All right, everybody. We got some good news. Jamal is over in Nigeria. Um, so. I get it all. I get it. That was one hell of a story, but let's let's at least stay up a little bit higher than USCIS. MAIC is in the house. What's up, MAIC? You're on mute. Hello? Can you hear me? Yep. 
Yes, so thank you for taking my call. Yeah. yeah I, have, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, Go for it. so uh, 2018, I entered US on J1 visa. Then 2019, I filed for asylum. And then till now, I didn't hear back for the interview. Yeah. And then now, I'm made to a US citizen. Yep. I was thinking to file for I want Terry, but I'm having a question with the the two year rule. So how does the waiver can I file one I tell you with the with the waiver or so if I were you, what I would do, if if you think you can make the waiver claim, is I would focus on the I on the waiver stuff first, work on that first. Yes. At least get that six months down the line, eight months down the line, because you never know how long those are gonna take. Mm -hmm. What kind of what kind of a program were you in? Who was funding your studies when you're on your J one? Oh it was C A P huh? program. It was C A P program. CAP program? Yes, it's agriculture based education. Yeah. So yeah. um you're going to I mean I would assume that the reason you want the waiver is sort of the same reasons you applied for asylum. Uh that's what I was thinking cuz I was like can I do it through the J1 through asylum or I can do it based on the merit? Well, that's always a tricky thing because the asylum, of course, relieves you of the two-year waiver requirement. But if you can get the waiver and you're married to a U.S. citizen, I would I would go ahead and apply for the waiver and see what happens. Keep asylum in your back pocket, and then if you get the waiver, then then file the I-130. Oh, so do the waiver through the asylum? No, no. Do the way apply for a straight out J-1 waiver through the State Department. Okay. Le leave your asylum case pending. Don't do any. I mean, your asylum case hasn't been interviewed or anything, right? Yes. So let that part play itself out mm -hmm. and, and leave the asylum case alone. Apply for the waiver. If you get it, then apply for a marriage-based green card. Otherwise, keep the asylum case. Just, you know, you're playing sort of defense. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my question. Thank you, my friend. Have a good day. Thank you. I'm still getting over Shaka's case. That was something else. I mean, you know, I try to keep track in my head because I'm like, I can make a TikTok about this. I can make a video about this, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, that case, that case just had everything in it. And he was so chill about it. So chill about it. I don't know what was going on. That was the, the best part is <laughs> um, he wanted to know about the appeal, about the, the check not clearing, the check being the wrong amount. Like, Brother, that's the least of your concerns. Man, oh, man. All right. Pablo's here. Hello, Pablo. Hey, hello, Gene. How are you doing? Good, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Just thinking about you should write a book about different stories. You know, people bring them I may, to the show. I may, I, I may or may not be working on just such a book. <laughs> okay, okay. That's fine. Well, Gene, uh, I think this is my third time we're here in the, the show. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first question is, uh, my wife, she's a U.S. citizen. Uh, the way she got her citizenship was that her father became a U.S. citizen. She was living abroad. And when she, I think, she, uh, she could come to the U.S. and then she got automatically uh, her citizenship and has yeah. her passport. Yeah. So my question, my question for you is that uh, a lawyer, uh, a family lawyer suggested to her to file for the N N six hundred, I think mm -hmm. that's a certificate of citizenship. Always, and it was like, oh, right, that's a good idea. Always a good idea. Okay, okay, that was my question. And my second question, this is on behalf of a friend of mine. Um, he's a lawful uh, resi uh, permanent resident, uh -huh. and he's about to go to the interview to become a citizen. Great. And he's been married with his wife since twenty twenty, so he filed a. I want Teddy for her. Now they're just waiting for the date, right? Priority date uh, when the visa become available for, for them. And now since he's becoming a citizen, I know that uh, he has access to, I mean, uh, 
probably he can uh, he can uh, what I would say uh, he doesn't have to wait for the priority date, right? If he becomes a U.S. citizen, is his wife inside the United States or overseas? No, no, she she's overseas. She comes uh, uh, and and go uh, to PC hand and everything. Has, has USCIS already approved the I one thirty? Not yet. Still is pending. That's okay. So so once. Once he gets a certificate of citizenship, he should make a copy of it and send it to the people, US, the part of USCIS that's adjudicating her I-130 and let them know that he's become okay. a citizen and he wants to upgrade. Okay, so uh, my question for you is that he, he was thinking like maybe she can come and just stay here and apply for adjustments of status after he does what you just said. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if he can do that. So, the big thing there is her intent. If she if she sells everything she owns and says, "I'm coming to the United States on a visit visa, and I'm really going to get I'm really going to um, get my I-130 approved and just hang out and get a green card," then that would be a problem. But if let's say let's say that she that she came on one of her regularly scheduled visits, and while she was here, he became a citizen, and while she was here, she decided. For the first time to just stay here and apply for adjustment i've handled that case many times i really like those cases it really helps cut out a lot of that consular processing but it's all about her intent so he can have all the intent that he wants but we don't want her to have that intent because that would get her in trouble but okay she, i got it you got it so she has a visit yeah um, if she has a visit and decides that she's free to do that but she can't come with the pre-determined intent of doing that if that makes sense it's a it's a yeah, but you get me. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it does make sense. Uh, okay, uh, those were actually my questions. Uh, Bye, thank Pablo. you very much. Have a great day. Good Bye. seeing you, buddy. Yep, for yes, sure. Sir. Gabriellis is here. What do you say, Gabriellis? Hi, how are you, Jim? Looks like you're at work. Were you sorting mail? I think you were sorting mail or something. Well, I'm a teacher, so I had to give it Oh, there you go. Nice. His exam, so I had to give it to him. Nice. Well, um, first of all, I want to say thank you on all the advice that you've given me which is awesome. Great. Um, I finally got my visa interview. Nice. Um, it's in two weeks. However, yeah. I'm, I'm a little worried and very apprehensive about everything that's that could go wrong, even though that I have a lot of faith and I believe in God and I think everything is going to go well. But um, there is something that I would like to know or what advice you give me if that question does come up during the interview. And it's because I used to be a green card holder, um, but I was sponsored through my parents when I was, a, well, fairly young. Then um, my green card was, I overstayed here in Panama for like, since 2005. And then I, I stayed until 2007. Then when I went back, um, when I tried to enter the States again, and that was in 2011, they told me that I had to see an immigration judge. However, since my, I had, I had just given birth to a child here in Panama and, um, we were working on that certificate of born abroad. She was born here in Panama, but she had not received her U S passport yet when I had, when I went back to the States. So I left her here in Panama with my fiance at that time. Now he's my husband. Um, and when I was there, they told me that I had to see an immigration judge. So they took away my green card and my passport at the port of entry. Um, however, I never got to see the judge because I only stayed six days and I came back because I had to attend my, my newborn child. So if that question comes up, I don't know how to respond to that. So who, who the, the interview that you're having now, it's in, it's in Panama? Yes. And it's based on an I-130 petition that who filed for you? My, my husband. Your husband's a U.S. citizen? Yes. And so you had a green card before. Did Through you, my... Mm -hmm. And do you have the paperwork of what happened? Like, have you gone ahead and done like a CBP FOIA to get a copy of, you know, whatever immigration paperwork there is related to when you entered and left no i haven't done that and so do you have any 
So you don't know exactly what happened as far as your immigration file, whether you were ordered deported. Like, did they give you a court date when you were coming at the border or no? Yes. Um, yes, they did. It was, well, not exactly. I think they didn't give me a court date. They just told me I had to see an immigration judge and that my green card was going to be valid until I think it was January 2012. So... So you're 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 asking me what how are you going to handle the question? I, I think it's a bigger question than this. I think I think this is a bit messier than you're thinking. I think that so your husband has an approved I-130. You've processed all through. What did you do on all the questions on the DS-260 about being deported before or about ever having an immigrant visa before? Did you how did you answer all those? I answered that I did. Um, in fact, I even gave him my A number um, since I had my A number. So I answered all the questions, however, um, I, uh, since I've never been deported, I never, and I said no, because I haven't been deported. I left. But I, think, I think maybe you were, I think maybe you were ordered deported in absentia without being there. I don't know for sure. That's why I'm, that's why I'm a little bit worried just because you, um, you haven't gotten the paperwork of what happened. Did they, did they, a lot of times, I don't know about 12 years ago, but a lot of times they'll like write out a single single space um, set of questions and answers about what what happened when you had that conversation with them do you remember anything about that no they just uh the only thing <laughs> was um they them taking away my passport and my green card and, and you're and you're talking about your panamanian passport yes and and, and what you just got a new panamanian passport no i since i had to come back what i did was i got something called an ex parte um, I think that was the name of it. And it was a, a paper that told me that I had to come, that I came back to Panama for one, it was only valid for one flight. And that's what I used. Do you still have that? Yes, I still have that. Okay. So that's good. Cause we need, but right now you have a passport, you have a new passport. Yes, I do. Well, sister, here's what I think. I mean, this is messy and I really wish that there was more data that you had about what happened back then we're sort of shooting in the dark where most likely this consular official is going to have more information. So obviously the number one thing is to be most, most important thing is to be honest and truthful about it. But then number two, they're, they're going to be confused by the whole fact pattern. Cause I'm a little confused by the whole fact pattern. So I would expect you're probably not going to get your visa approved that day. And they're going to want to do some digging if they haven't already, if they have already, then, um, then you're probably going to have a conversation about it. But as long as you have proof, if you lived outside the United States for the last 10 years, yeah, yes. so you're just gonna, you're just going to need to prove that up, I think, probably. So I would bring some evidence of that. But I mean, I, I, I don't like this so much. I wish we had more time before your interview so we could track down your file. But I think you just got to go in there and be honest and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was like basically the question I had. All right. Well, good luck. Okay. I'll come back and let you know. Yeah. Let happened. us know for sure. Thank you, Gabriella. Good luck. See ya. All right. Paul is here. Hello, Paul. Hey, hello, Jim. How you doing? Good, buddy. What's up? Uh, first time caller here. Just want to say thanks for doing this show. Sure. First welcome. Folks are having these immigration challenges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so a little bit of history, my wife and I. So um, we met in Europe in 2019. She's from Belgium, originally from the Philippines, but now a Belgium citizen. I was living in the Netherlands. Um, I left the Netherlands in 2021. I returned in 2022 to get married to her in June. Nice. We filed for our uh, I-130 in September of 2022, and it got approved in August 23. Okay. So now it's with NBC. Yeah. Um, it was documentary approved 29 September 2023. Our party date is 17 September 2022. Did you say did you say it was DQ December or September? Uh September. Okay. So our party date is September uh 2022. So a question I have, she's originally from the Philippines but now is a Belgium citizen. Where does she live? Belgium. She's a okay. citizen of Belgium. Okay. Uh her interview will be done at the embassy in Brussels. So Great. on uh the NBC website it says her foreign state of chargeability is the Philippines. Is that going to yeah. impact her is that going to slow down her processing time? You're a U.S. citizen? Okay, yes. No, it won't. I mean, other than the fact that 
whenever a, I mean, you said she's a Belgian citizen now, but in their mind, she's always and always will be a Filipino citizen, which she is. So I would say no, like they're not, there's no country delay or country specific stuff. It's just whenever there's an issue of somebody getting their immigrant visa in a country other than where they're originally from, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, but nothing to worry about. Okay. So it's been with NVC since September. What If you had to look into a crystal ball, could you estimate how long it will be before so, she gets her interview? So you should you should probably try and find some, uh, some uh, um, like chat boards and stuff. Belgium is not an embassy. I don't know that our office in 15 years has ever worked with the embassy in Belgium. I would imagine like most European ones, they're pretty fast. I would think you're probably a month or two away, but I would look for people going through the process through the consulate in Belgium. Where is okay. it, in Antwerp or where is it? Uh, it'd be Brussels. In Brussels, yeah. So just look for people that are going through it in Brussels. I would think four to six months is what I would be thinking. Okay. And then uh, since this is a CR1 visa, is that uh, same processing time for an IR1? Mm -hmm. Okay. They treat then, the uh, What's the date of your marriage? Uh, June of 2022. Yeah. So our so, two year anniversary will be this year. Got it. Yeah. I don't think Brussels is busy. David says Brussels is not that busy. I think that's true. Okay. I think you're good. Now, can we do a uh, change of status for our, after we've been married for two years? Okay. So let's say the scenario is her visa does not get approved until after our second anniversary. And she'll get a, she'll get a 10 year green card. Okay. And there's nothing that we have to do with transparent to NVC. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. That's it. And my my wife shape. is a huge, say again. I think you're in good shape. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. My wife is a huge fan of you. Awesome. Uh, it's kind of scary because whenever I call her, I hear your voice in the background. <laughs> Who's that man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, when, um, when she gets her visa and you guys are together, come back on and we'll say hi. Outstanding. I appreciate it, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Have Paul. a good day. See you, buddy. All right, everyone, that'll do it for today's show. We'll be back tomorrow for episode 520. We're one fifth of the way to 600. Four o'clock tomorrow. I think we're doing a show the rest of the week every day. Maybe not Friday. We'll see. Uh, I am going to do a talk tonight for the international students at a school down in Texas on the Zoom. So hope you all have a great night. And we'll see you tomorrow at four.